Thanks for joining us for today's message. We encourage you to visit southernhillslv.com to watch or listen to past messages. We hope you enjoy today's message from God's Word. The sermon series is entitled Victorious, My Kingdom Overthrown. This is sermon number three in the sermon series. We said it starts in the heart. Then you choose your king. Today's sermon is entitled Surrender Your Throne. Next week we conclude with experience your victory. Surrender your throne. Let us pray. Father in heaven, my prayer today is that you would do in these moments what only you can do. I need you, Father, to fill me with your Holy Spirit as you have filled this place with your holy people, that you would give us the understanding of your holy word. I pray that my words would not be my words, but they would be you speaking through me to your people. Teach us what your Bible has to say to us today and help us to see the great danger of being the wreck and ruin of a human soul that we see in the story here today. In Jesus' name, we pray you would teach us how to surrender our throne that true victory comes when our kingdom is overthrown. Help us, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Are, you, are you in need of a vacation? Anybody in here that would say, I need a vacation? How many is like, look, I don't know about these other people. I mean, and they're a little watch Netflix all day life. <laughs> but I need a vacation. How many of you say, I need a vacation? How many of you say that? Okay, I need a vacation. My hand is up too. I need a, I need a vacation. So what I'm saying is your pastor, send me on a vacation. No, I'm just kidding. All right. I need a vacation. You need a vacation. What kind of vacation would you, if anything, like just say, if I had a vacation to this place, this is where it'd be. Somebody tell me, somebody shout something out to Hawaii, right? Go to Hawaii. Beautiful place and the flowers. I walked out of the airport in Hawaii one time. The very first time I was there, I walked out and the sun was coming up because I took an overnight flight because I'm cheap. And I arrived and the flowers were falling from the sky. I thought, this is, this is like heaven. It's beautiful. Somebody else. What else? Uh, yes. Anywhere away from the kids. Anywhere away from the kids. Give this man a round of applause. That's right. Say, he doesn't love his children. No, he loves his children so much. He spends time with them. Now he needs a break. Amen. Uh, how about a cruise? How many of you like going on the cruise? I love going on cruise ships. Like this cruise ship, a beautiful, big, celebratory cruise. I love cruises. I'll tell you why I love cruises. Because of the food. It's so good. And I love cruises because of the destinations. And I also love cruises because of the food. It's so good. And because on a cruise ship, there are all these amazing amenities. And also because they have good food, you know. I'm going on a cruise. I would not go on this ship, though, and I want to warn you about this ship. Is anybody, anybody familiar with that ship? <laughs> it's called the Costa Concordia, and it was a very well-known, beautiful luxury liner that would sail up and down the Mediterranean, going to places like Rome and Greece and Spain, amazing locations, but then suddenly, uh, well, it fell, it wrecked, it ruined, and it's really sad to read the story. Everybody was fine, everybody's okay, but it's really sad to see the story of the ship and the loss of the ship itself. In fact, all those who have sailed on the ship, you can read threads online. Oh, I remember how beautiful it was. And the staterooms and the balconies and amazing dining facilities, and people are just, just emote over losing the ship because... There's nothing sadder than a wreck or ruin like this. Wasted. Gone. But of all wrecks and ruins that I've ever seen, the wreck and ruin of a human soul is far, far worse. The saddest of all wrecks, the saddest of all ruins, is the ruin of a human soul. The soul that was once God's, the soul that could be His, the soul that had purpose and design. Listen to me, every human soul that is under my, the sound of my voice, hear me. Whether you're listening on the radio later, online later, hear what I'm saying. Your soul has value and it has purpose and has direction and God has a plan for you. You're uniquely designed by God. And to see a wreck or ruin of a human soul, the greatest tragedy of all, and that's what today's story is. It's the story of a unique soul, child of God, that was wrecked and ruined and potentially forever destroyed, but for the grace of God. How can you avoid this ruin? 
Today I'm going to tell you the story of a wrecked, ruined soul, and I want you to ask this question to yourself, how can I avoid the ruin? Say it with me. How can I avoid the ruin? No, 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 everyone, say it with me. How can I avoid the ruin? This story will give you three elements that will show you how to avoid the ruin. First, you and I must evaluate our condition. Point number one, if you're following along and taking notes, to avoid ruin, you must honestly evaluate your condition. How bad off are you? Some of you sit here today and say, not bad off at all. I'm doing pretty good. Look at me. I'm pretty good. <laughs> Mark chapter 5 and verse 1. And they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadareans. Who are they? That's Jesus and his disciples. Where are they coming from? Oh, they're coming from the west coast of the Sea of Galilee. They're going to the east coast of the Sea of Galilee. Oh, this is better to explain it this way. This is a map of Israel during the time of Jesus Christ. And as you see in the map, there are several regions that are significant here. Judea in the south, that brown area. That's where Jesus goes in Jerusalem and eventually where he's crucified and buried. Over to the right, you see a place called Decapolis. It's called Decapolis, that purple section, because it means 10 cities. Deca meaning 10, polis meaning cities. It's a region that was referred to as the area of 10 cities. In the top there, in the brown, it says Galilee. Galilee is well known to Christians because that's where Jesus spent most of his time ministering to people. He taught people there. And his headquarters were right there on the Sea of Galilee. This is a closer look of the Sea of Galilee. Right on the top left corner, you see a place called Capernaum. Capernaum was the headquarters of Jesus and where many of the stories that we've been reading have been taking place. But the Bible says that Jesus gets in a ship with his disciples and they went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee to the country of the Gadareans. The Gadareans would be where it says Gergesa. That would be the region called the Gadareans. It was called the Gadareans because there was a tribe of Israel that, that, that left there and, and lived there thousands of years before called the tribe of Gad. And so a lot of Jewish people were from there, a specific tribe grew there, and they raised their families there. So this was the land of the Gadareans. But what took place when they docked their ship on the other side of the sea is perhaps one of my favorite stories of all time. In fact, I almost entitled this sermon, The Nude Dude in the Rude Mood. <laughs> Say, why didn't you name it that? Maybe I will, I don't know. <laughs> You'll see why I call it that in just a moment. The Bible tells us, it goes on in verse 2, and when Jesus had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He was demon-possessed. A man coming to him who was demon-possessed. And he had his dwelling among the tombs. Where do you live? I live in the graveyard. Not a good place to live. And no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. The town folk thought he was insane, so they tried to bind him up with shackles and chains. And the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And so we see the disciples and Jesus disembarking off of their little ship. And they get off to the coast, and as they do, it was the middle of the night, remember, at that point, and the sun perhaps was just rising in the east. And, and they notice something strange. Imagine you're one of the disciples with Jesus. Imagine with me. And now you're stepping off the ship, and you hear something from the distance. It's a howl. Oh! Ah! Sun is just coming up. Ah! You get off the ship, and you notice a graveyard in the distance. This was a graveyard that was carved out of the mountainsides, little caves where the village individuals would place their people, their dead, and they would wall it up. And you notice the graveyard and you hear the howling. Oh! And then all of a sudden, somebody starts running toward you with long matted hair gaping wounds of blood pouring from his body, eyes as wide as saucers, stark naked, and he's running toward you with stones. If you're a disciple like me, it's time to get back on the boat. 
How many of you with me? You're like, I think we came to the wrong place. Let's, let's go. But that's not at all what happens. Jesus, instead of running from this man, Jesus, instead of running from this man's problems, he addressed these problems head on. Look at what it says. And always night and day he was in the mountains and the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. How sad the story of this man is. How tragic is the story of this ruined life. Think of the moment his wife and his family and his friends begin to notice the subtle differences that were happening inside of him. He began to say things that he he never said before. He began to act in an erratic way. Perhaps even back then, they had people come that would deal with mental health issues in their specific ways, and they thought, maybe he just has some mental health issues. Maybe he needs help, until they realized this is far beyond a mental health issue. He began to not only speak violently, but then he began to act violently toward his children, toward his spouse, toward his neighbors. And they thought, as a city council, perhaps as a town council, we can't let him do this. We've got to bind him. So they did. So they took him and they put ropes around him, perhaps like they did with Samson. But the ropes could not hold him. He had something supernatural inside of him, something that gave him power over natural things. And he would break the ropes and would be freed. They said, if the ropes won't work, let's try chains. Let's try shackles. And so they grabbed shackles and they tackled him to the ground and they shackled him up. But there he was in a prison and with supernatural power strength that came not from the God of heaven, but from the depths of hell. He broke those chains and began to run the city. They didn't know what else to do. So there was only one thing they could do with the cries of their children behind them, with the wife calling out, saying, no, don't get rid of him. The town folk take the man and they thrust him out of the city. The only place he could go then was the graveyard. The only place that would have him was the tombs. The only people who would lay beside him in the depths of the darkness of night were the dead. And they alone received this man. Oh, he was bad off. My friend, he was bad off. Do you have pity for him? Listen to me. Does your heart break for him? Perhaps our heart is not broken for him because we are not self-aware that we are him. Oh, no, not me, pastor. I'm one of the disciples with Jesus. I got off the ship and I see the maniac. No, friend, you misunderstand the story. You ain't one of the disciples in the story. You're the maniac. It's a terrible thing not to be self-aware. It's a tragic thing to think yourself better than you are. when everybody else can see what you can't. I have a lot of preacher friends, pastor friends. Um, I, I love pastors. Amen? Amen. Come on, people. I set you up. I pass you a, t- a softball there. You could have been, amen, pastor, we love you. You just did nothing with it. Really disappointed in you. I love pastors. Oh, yeah. Well, feels forced. Um, I love hearing my friends who are pastors preach. Sometimes I'll go online and watch their sermons. They'll put them up like I do. I I love especially being there in person. Amen? Amen Amen. Amen online? Amen. All right. (laughs) Subtle jab. All right. I I love watching them. I remember I was sitting in one specific situation where one of my best friends, I won't give his name, he was going to preach a sermon. He's a pastor friend of mine. And I sat in the back with his wife and my wife, and we're going to watch the sermon. I was really excited about it. I got my Bible open. I'm like on the edge of my seat. I'm like, come on. I'm always doing the preaching. I'm ready to get the preaching. I'm sitting there ready to go. And as he walks up and he stands there, he says, turn in your Bibles. I noticed something, I think, before other people did not notice. I noticed that this poor friend of mine his zipper was down. And I don't mean half-masked people. I mean, it was all the way down. That's all I'm going to say about this terrible situation. 
By the way, this is, a, this, is a, this is a nightmare of mine. I wake up with cold sweats. I used to, you know why I sit up here and not up here? Zipper check. <laughs> I used to sit up here on Sunday mornings, way back in the old building. I used to sit up here and we used to sing, have a couple people sitting up here as a pastor. I used to sit up here. And every, <laughs> I remember I'd get up ready to preach. And before I get up to preach, I probably did it like four or five times. I'm like, you know, I was pretending to scratch my hand. And I'm like, <laughs> checking. You know what I mean? Like, you just got to make sure everything's copacetic fine. You don't want that to happen. It's a scary thing as a public speaker. And there he was up there, and, and it was terrible. I'm like, I, got, I stood up in the back, and I started whipping like, and he's like, <laughs> I'm like, you know, I'm trying to do it. It was weird. I really felt bad for him, because there's nothing sadder than watching somebody who is utterly unaware of how bad it looks. The first step to avoid ruin in your life is to evaluate, honestly evaluate your condition. Look at me. There are not three easy steps that are going to fix your problem. There is one person who can save you. Well, all you got to do is do a little adjustment here and a little adjustment here. You're wrong. You are not being honest with yourself. You are not honestly evaluating your condition. You have deceived yourself into thinking that you are sufficient. Look at me. I'm talking about some of us in this room have deceived ourselves into thinking you are sufficient for salvation. All you need to do is start going to church. Maybe I'll get baptized like they did. Then I'll be saved. Wrong, wrong, wrong. You cannot save yourself by self-improvement or good works. You must understand you are totally depraved in and of yourself, utterly unable to redeem your lost condition. No sacrament can save you. No church can save you. No priest can save you. No pastor can save you. No rabbi can save you. The only person that can save you is Jesus Christ. Honestly evaluate your condition. You need to understand you have been deceived into thinking you can be sufficient for your salvation. Listen to me. Some of us have been deceived into thinking you're sufficient for your success. All I got to do is work a little harder. All I got to do is make one other sale. All I got to do is get one more person behind me. No, friend. All you got to do is evaluate your condition and realize I am lost, utterly, hopelessly away from the future that God has apart from Christ. We see first, you must eva- to avoid this type of ruin, you need to evaluate your condition. Number two, you need to calculate your options. Say that with me now. Calculate your options. Look to your neighbor right now. Look to your neighbor. Look to your neighbor and say, are you going to choose Jesus? Look what it says in verse 6. Look what it says. See, that was weird. Yeah, it was a little weird, you know. <laughs> Thought we'd try it, you know. <laughs> Look at verse 6. And when, Je- and when he saw Jesus from afar, this is the maniac, this is the demon-possessed man, he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him, and he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. Ooh, ooh. Do you see the fear? Listen, listen. I don't care how bad off you are. You have nothing to fear when it comes to Jesus. He's going to restore you to what you were intended to be. Look at verse 8. And Jesus said to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? Jesus bypasses the man and speaks directly to the demon inside. What is your name? And he answered and said, my name is Legion, for we are many. There was not one demon inside of this man. There was a plethora of demons, many demons, a legion of demons. And he begged him earnestly that he answered him saying, my name is Legion, for we are many, and begged him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. So the demons cry out and they say, Jesus, Jesus, whatever you do, don't send us from the country. Country, what does that mean? What does that mean? What were the demons so afraid of? Well, I'll explain to you for those who are unfamiliar with demonology or the study of the underworld or the study of hell and heaven, the study of the abyss and the pit, the study of demons and disembodied spirits. Let me explain to you what they're afraid of. They're saying, Jesus, please, whatever you do, don't send us out of the country. 
A disembodied spirit is a type of demon that must, in order to maintain residence in this world, must be indwelling of a physical being. Must. There is a place called the abyss, a place called the pit. It is a place that God created for the devil and his angels, humans, devil and his demons, humans were never intended to go to this hellish place. Never. God did not create you to damn you. God created you and loves you. But this place was created for the rebellion of the devil and the demons, the Bible teaches us. And these disembodied spirits, the moment they meet Jesus, they know that Jesus is going to save this man and he's going to get us out of the man. And so they say, Jesus, Jesus, whatever you do, don't send us to the abyss. Don't kick us out of this country. So what does Jesus do? Verse 14. So those who fed swine, oh, look what it says. No, I'm sorry, verse number 11. It says, now a large herd of swine was feeding near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, send us to the swine that we may enter into them. And at once Jesus gave them permission, and the unclean spirit went out and entered into the swine. There were about 2,000, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. Notice this about the demons. They were presented with an option. They calculated their options. They said, okay, 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 we know we can't stay in the guy. I get it. Okay, so instead of sending us to the abyss, send us, send us into the swine. We can live there. We can stay there. It's flesh. We can live inside of them. Jesus allows them. And a moment, notice, the Bible says all of the demons depart from the man. They go inside of this swine. And this herd of 2,000 swine make their way to the sea coast where there was a cliff. And they all, like lemmings, fall into the sea. They would have rather spent the next years inside of a pig drowning at the bottom of a, of a lake rather than being damned to the abyss because the demons know what the abyss is like. If you knew what it was like, friend, you'd do anything you could to avoid it. I said, Pastor, what do I got to do? What do I got to do? Tell me what I got to do. Do I got to do like some sacraments? Do I got to do some prayers? Tell me what prayers to pray. Friend, there's nothing you can do to avoid the abyss. There's nothing you can do to avoid hell. You've already earned hell because you're a sinner, just like I have earned hell. There is a place marked for you. There is a header above your door. You're going there because you're a sinner. You say, but I don't want to go there. Well, thank God he sent his son to die for your sins. The only way out of your destiny is a wrecked and ruined soul that is destined for the pit is to repent of your sin and receive Christ as Savior today. That's what you can do. You can be saved. If you've never been saved, I beg you, look, this is what I do. I beg you, receive Christ. Humble yourself. Call upon Jesus Christ. Even today, you'll be saved. Even today. I think about the farmer. This poor guy, you know, poor farmer, he's getting up for his morning coffee. He's sitting there in his little kitchen, bay windows, not historically accurate, but that's how I see it. <laughs> he's got this beautiful little pig farm, right? Right there, on the, right there on the Sea of Galilee. Spent his whole life thinking, man, I want to buy that home. I'm going to be a pig farmer right there on that home. This is going to be great. And, and there he is, and he grabs his coffee, pours a little creamer in there, a little Splenda. He's on a diet. <laughs> he starts to drink his cup, and all of a sudden he hears the pigs. I mean, he loves his home. The only problem he has is there's a graveyard pretty close, and there's like this wild man, you know. It's, but he avoids them, you know. And all of a sudden, he hears, Wah! you know, it's like, what is that? And he's looking out his bay window, and his pigs are going crazy. So he gets up from his kitchen table, he opens the door, and the pigs are rioting, and they're knocking down the fence, and now the pigs, his livelihood, his entire business, they're running toward the cliff, and they're falling into the ocean. And he's thinking to himself, well, this is not going to be a good quarter. 
drops his coffee on the ground and he gets upset. Well, this is what happens. Look at what happens. The Bible says, so that those who fed the swine and they told the city of the, about the country, so the Bible says they ran to the town and they're like, hey, people, you, you got to see what this guy just did. Look what happens. And they went out to see what, what had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had a legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. Can you imagine these town people as they arrive? And there this man is. He's the maniac. We tried to subdue him and nothing would work. And now he's sitting at the knees of Jesus, worshiping Jesus with a robe placed over his shoulders and several men standing in front of Jesus. They were in shock. Look at this. It says they were afraid. And those who saw it told him how it had happened and how the demon-possessed man about the swine... And look at what happens. Look at verse 17. This is key. This is key. Don't miss it. Then they began to plead with Jesus. And they said to Jesus, we want to be saved too. Is that what it says? No, instead it says, Jesus, we want you to leave. They, too, were calculating their options. That's what the whole passage is about. The maniac is given an option. Jesus, surrender your throne to him, or keep your throne and allow the demons to control you. The demons were presented with an option. And now the town folk are presented with an option. Here's the option. Do you want Jesus in your life? And their answer is, no, we don't want Jesus in our life. You say, why in the world did they not want Jesus in their life? Here's why. Because they knew the truth. Jesus is going to mess you up. Listen to me. The reason some reject Jesus is because they truly believe, they know, Jesus is going to mess me up. I give my life to Jesus Christ. I repent of my sin and receive Christ as my Savior. My life as I once knew it, gone. Yep. The reason some people don't want to receive Christ is because they've not properly evaluated their condition. They see themselves better off than they really are. Anybody remember this television show? My wife and I used to love this television show. Anybody remember this one? How do you remember The Biggest Loser? You remember The Biggest Loser? Now some of you are getting really convicted right now. Relax, it's cool. The Biggest Loser was a lot of fun watching that show because it always opened up the same way. It's like every reality show, they always open up by telling the backstories of the contestants, you know? They're at their home, and you'd see some big guy, and you know, he's he'd go and stop him by Taco Bell, and he's going to eat, you know, he's got like 62 tacos, you know? <laughs> the producers, you know the producers, how they're like, they're like, how many do you want, 10? No, no, like, give them 40, you know? And they're filming the whole thing. That's how it goes down. They're like, they go to his refrigerator, and they open up the refrigerator, and it's like all... Krispy Kremes, you know, or something like that. And the entire time as you're watching the beginning of the show and they're showing the backstories of these people and you know what's going to happen. You know how the story ends. What's going to happen is they're going to be transformed into something very small and healthy and it's going to be amazing and it's a very cool and emotional journey. And I'm watching this and I remember as I was watching and I'm watching this early on in these episodes, I always thought the same thing. Oh, oh, wait till Bob Harper gets his hands on you. <laughs> Oh, man, I can't wait till Julian meets this woman. She's going to mess her up. <laughs> Some would never put themselves in that scenario because they don't want their life messed up. They're okay with it. They're a wreck and they're a ruin. And they don't want to be messed up. It's because you don't understand. Listen to me. Coming to Jesus Christ, listen to me, please don't miss it. Becoming to Jesus Christ, you think of yourself as the ship that is sailing on the sea, beautiful, pristine, and perfect. This is how you see yourself. Maybe there's a few problems. Maybe I need a few tweaks, but actually I'm okay. And what I'm saying is you need to see yourself not as this. You need to see yourself as that. <coughs> Jesus doesn't mess you up. He restores you to what you used to be. 
Is it painful? Yes. Is it difficult? Yes. Is it tough? Yes. When he pulls things out of your life you don't want pulled out of your life. When he makes you make decisions that you were uncomfortable with at first. When he challenges you to do things you never thought possible. Is it uncomfortable? Yes, it's uncomfortable. But that's the only way change takes place. See, you've got to calculate your options. You've got to make a decision. You see, you understand people. The town people looked at Jesus and they said, you're going to mess us up. No, my friend, Jesus was not there to mess them up. He was there to restore their homes, their families, their businesses, their towns, their cities, their countries, their souls back to what they were originally to be. You say, well, do I have an option? Yes, you have an option, but it's not the option you think. Some of us think to themselves, if I give my throne over to Christ, then he'll rule my life. I don't want him to rule my life, so I will keep the throne. You misunderstand how the option works. The maniac did not have the choice to rule his own life or give it to Jesus. He had a choice. Do I give my life to Jesus or do I let these demons control my life? The devil presents you with a wrong option. He says to you, you can be in control or Jesus can be in control. That doesn't work that way. You give your life to Christ or you will be controlled by the world, the flesh, or the devil, period. Calculate your options, folks. Can I get an amen? Amen. Okay, point number three, and then we got to go. Point number three, evaluate your condition, calculate your option. Number three, abdicate your throne. Abdicate. Give it up. Give it up. I want you to say with me, I'm not the king. Say it. I'm not the king. king. Say it again. Say, I'm not the king. king. Come on, ladies. Say, I'm not the queen. queen. There we go. Look at me, look at me. Verse 18. And when he had gotten to the boat, wait, what? What? Look at the verse. And when he had got into the boat, what? Jesus is getting back in the boat? What is the deal? He came there to save just one person? Well, yeah, for Jesus, one is good enough. He'll do anything to reach one soul. He who had been demon possessed begged Jesus that he might go with him. Notice what happens. Jesus is getting back in the boat and the demon-possessed man who was once demon-possessed, the former maniac, comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, hey, Jesus, hey, hey, guys, 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 guys. Hey, can I go with you and be one of your disciples? How could Jesus refuse? But this is the twist in the story. Verse 19 says, Jesus said, no. Now, that makes no sense, right? If I'm there, I'm like, yeah, you do not want to live in this town. These people are cray-cray. Let's get out of here. You're following me. But Jesus says, no, look at me. Jesus says, no, you can't come with me. Hey, let me ask you a question. What do you do when Jesus doesn't give you the answer you're looking for? Let me, let me ask you a question. What do you do when Jesus responds incorrectly? The answer is, listen to me, the answer is, you surrender your throne. This is the surrender moment. You say, whoa, 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 I thought the surrender moment was when the demons were gone. Yes, that was a surrender moment, but welcome to Christianity. Every day you have to surrender your throne to Jesus. Every day. Some of us, every hour. Some of you like me, every minute. See, when Jesus doesn't respond the way he should, we respond to Jesus and say, yes, sir. When Jesus says no, look at me. When Jesus says no to that relationship, when Jesus says no to that job, when Jesus says no to that ministry, when Jesus says no to that hobby, that's when you abdicate your throne and say, okay, Jesus, if you don't want me to have it, I don't want it. But it's my life. No, it's not your life. That's the whole point of the sermon. The whole point of the sermon, go, you say, well, it is my life. Go, 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 do your thing. But for those who are surrendering their throne, it's his life. He'll live through you, and he's going to say no in areas you may not understand. In areas even the disciples were probably saying, how in the world? You see, some need to surrender their throne for salvation, but hear me, some in this room need to surrender their throne for obedience. When you say, I'm just tired, Jesus. 
I'm tired, I'm sick and tired, I just need something to numb my thoughts, I just want to go down with 100 bucks or 500 bucks and just lose my paycheck so I can think about nothing, and Jesus says no, and you say, it's my life, you're taking the, you're taking the crown right back from him. What is Jesus asking you to do? For example, Jesus was asking Karen to bring 100 people this year. Karen is a member of our church. She's so sweet. Um, she got saved and has been growing in the Lord, and she's got a long way to go like we all do. Amen? Amen. She came to me a couple weeks ago. She said, <laughs> I almost cry. <laughs> she came out to me. She said, Jesus, Pastor Jesus has done so much for me. He's changing my life. She said, I made a commitment to bring 100 people to Southern Hills in 2019. I said, well, that's amazing. She said, man, if Jesus has done it for me, he can do it for others. That's my goal. Pray that I can do that, Pastor. It's not easy. Do you know how weird it is to walk up to somebody? Do you know how weird? It's weird. It's weird. It's weird right? You're a good Christian. You come in, you're like, oh, I'm a Christian. Look, I'm a Christian. You know? the, best, the best some of us get when it comes to evangelism is we check in at Southern Hills on Facebook, you know. I was at church praising Jesus. Then you're like, join me. Delete, delete, delete. Well, that's good enough, you know. Look, it's weird to walk up to somebody and say, my life was a mess, but I met Jesus. He saved me. He saved me and I want to show you what that's like. It's really odd. But some of you need to make a decision right now to do that. And by the way, the reason Jesus said no to this man was so that he can go and do just that. Look at what it says. He said, Jesus, Jesus, can I come with you? However, Jesus did not permit him, but said unto him, go home to your friends and tell them the great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. No, you can't come with me. Go. Go to your towns. Go back to your wife and your kids and the village people. Not those village people. That's totally different. Like some of us were thinking, the why it's different. Go and reach them. Say, Jesus has changed me. And he departed and he began. Look at what it says. He departed and he began to proclaim throughout the Acropolis that Jesus had done for him and they all marveled. Now look at this. Can you imagine... Can you imagine him standing on the rocky coast of Gadaria as the disciples board the ship and they lift up the anchor and some of the disciples are thinking, Jesus, why hasn't he letting them come? And he stands there all by himself in somebody else's borrowed robe, no clothes underneath. And they set sail, the sails go up and Jesus and the disciples start to part out into the sea. I wonder how long he stood there. Did he wait until the boat was simply out of sight before he turned around and he faced his mission? All the way home thinking to himself, I hope Jesus knows what he's doing. He comes across the shepherds. Hey, 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 legion's coming. Get the sheep in. And he walks by. Little boys playing on the outskirts of town. Hey, hey, guys, get out of here. Legion's coming. Look, there he is. And he walks by. A woman out in front of her home, sweeping the porch, gathers her children. There's the man. There he is. There's that man. And he gets to his home, the home he used to just walk into, and this time he knocks. And there he sees his wife and his children for the first time. It's not easy to surrender your throne and do what Jesus tells you to do. But it's always worth it. It's always worth it. Say, Pastor, do you have to surrender your throne daily? I'll end with this. Yes. Every day. I got saved when I was a child. And then I got baptized. But this is what I've learned as a Christian. Every day, every day, every day I have to surrender my throne. When I wake up in the morning and I have to choose between prayer and my phone, 
I have to surrender my throne. Uh, it's your life, not mine, Jesus. Let's go to prayer. When I get to the office <laughs> and there's a box of Dunkin' Donuts <laughs> and I've calculated how many calories I have and I have to say no to the second one, that's surrendering my throne. <laughs> I need recognition, people. When I go home and I'm flipping through the channels all by myself and something comes up that is semi-pornographic. And oh man, I have to surrender my throne. When a coworker irritates me, I say, oh, pastor, you work at the church. Do you know Fred? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, but for real, right? You know. That call out though. Thank you have to surrender my throne. God has been doing this big time in my life lately, and that is God telling me, give. Like literally the last two years, it seems like every time I see a need, God's like, hey, I want you to give. And I'm a very, very selfish, greedy person. I truly am. I really am. I'm like, I already give so much to the church. And God's like, no, give them some money. You know, every time, every time I have to think, it's not my throne, it's his. You see, victory doesn't come when you become the king. Victory comes when your kingdom is overthrown by a more powerful king. Amen. Let's pray. Father, you're still in the battle for the souls of men, and you desire, you desire surrender. And my prayer is that the men and women in this room who are ready will bow their knee before you and surrender their throne, not just today, but in the months, in the days, and the weeks to come. In the name of Jesus, we pray. If God has used this message to impact your life, we would love to hear from you. Please send an email to connectdesk at southernhillslv.com. If you would like to support this ministry financially, you can do so at southernhillslv.com slash give. We are always encouraged to hear how God is using this church in Las Vegas to reach God's people around the world. 